Welcome to the CSM Podcast with David Nickturn. Creativity, spirituality, and making a buck. Blending spiritual and temporal realities, joining heaven and earth. We will be talking with a variety of manifestors, individuals who have, in one way or another, clarified their vision, created an offering, and brought that offering to the marketplace. Let's see what we can learn from them as we each move forward towards solving our own life puzzle. Facing the challenge of living in the spirit, in the body, in the world, in this time. If you're interested in supporting the CSM podcast, please visit eherenownetwork.com forward slash David. Hello, everybody. I'm David Nickturn, and welcome to another edition of my podcast, Creativity, Spirituality, and Making a Buck. Uh, today's guest is my friend Daniel Aiken, who happens to be my publisher of uh, my books and also is a serious Dharma brother and companion along the uh, meditation path, a student of Garwang Rinpoche, serious student. So we're going to talk to Daniel a little bit about some of his uh, aspects of his life and bringing together these different elements of his life. Uh, first, Daniel, maybe could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Mm -hmm. So I'm publisher of Wisdom Publications, um, and I have a PhD in Buddhist studies, so I'm focusing on the Tibetan language mainly. And I've had senior executive roles in a number of multinationals, mainly to do with marketing and branding. Uh, and that led those twin sort of parallel interests in my life of business and Dharma sort of have come together and joined in my most, you know, in this um, incarnation of my career as you know, at Wisdom Publications. So. Considering the book that we just put out together, Creativity, yeah. Spirituality, and Making a Buck, now that I'm thinking about it, it's just hugely auspicious that we ended up working on that book uh, and putting it out through your company because you are a manifesto of those principles, mm -hmm. clearly. Yeah, you speak a lot about tendril. Uh huh. And I think this is a form of tendril for myself that yeah. this manuscript came across my desk. And it's the type of uh, dharma meets practical life that mm. I love. Mm. You know, the, the testing ground for this wisdom. You know, business is a great workshop to test these, these um, practices in. So, yeah, yeah, I love your book for that reason. Can you explain what tendril is for folks who might not know? A tendril, you, you often talk about tendril as like an auspicious connection, right? There's different terms in Tibetan. Uh, Trinle or Tendril, Tendril Gijungwa, and it means dependent origination. But in this sort of context, it means the coming together of mm. um, different conditions. And you use the word synchronicity. Mm. And I think that's a, that's a, that gets to it, that word synchronicity. Well, so of course, it's interesting to consider what role did that play, for example, in you meeting your teachers? You have some very, very uh, potent and, you know, kind of highly regarded Tibetan teachers. And you must have met them somewhere along the way. How did that happen? You know, I was very interested in Dharma from a young age. Mm -hmm. And how young? Very young. So I was definitely, you know, reading Dharma books when I was like 10, 11. Mm -hmm. uh, no, actually, sorry, probably 13, mm -hmm. more like 13. Mm -hmm. Seriously, just reading and searching. And then after a while, you know, went looking for Dharma centers and used to drop into different Dharma centers. At 13 in Australia? No, a little bit later. So like I'd be reading, 13 I was at high school, so reading at high school. And then um, later, you know, as I got into college, I, you know, got out into the world a little bit more and looked, you know, dropped into Dharma centers. So what and, year are we talking about? When, when were you God. in college? I was in college, 80s, 90s, early 90s. Early 90s. Yeah. And were there Dharma centers in Australia at that point? I didn't, th the first one I was reading, I didn't think there were. Uh -huh. But it turned out that there was, you know, there was great interest in Dharma in Australia and there was many centers. Tibetan particularly? Yeah, Tibetan or? Buddhist centers, but in Sydney. You know, uh -huh. I was a little bit of um, where I grew up was about an hour out of Sydney. So then I, um, but then, you know, and then sometimes visiting teachers would come through. So then I'd drop into different centers, but eventually I found my way to this center in Sydney and saw and met a teacher there that really struck an accord with me. Just met him at a talk or something? Yeah, he, you know, I'd go into Dharma talks and then. Um, and then I'd ask the teacher a question or two uh -huh. and normally be unsatisfied with the answer. Were you kind of a smart aleck kid or did, you know? Oh, you... I don't think so. I don't know. But, did, uh, did you feel respectful to them? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So I, you know, very respectful and just uh -huh. sort of asked questions at the end. Uh -huh. um, but then this teacher, I sort of asked some questions and um, 
was blown away by the answers. And so then I kept asking questions. Yeah. And then I was like, it seemed like this Lama knew everything. And who was that? That was Geshe Ngong something. Who's one of your main teachers? One of my main teachers, right. yeah. And do you remember any question you asked him and what answer he gave you? No. I can't remember exactly. I just remember yeah. the feeling. Okay. The feeling of, yeah. oh my gosh. Right. And then that the answers were so exact and precise. Wow. So that really yeah. captured me. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to hang around a little bit. Yeah. So you still work with that teacher, right? Yes. And, and he's obviously older than you, right? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot older? Or? No. Mm -hmm. uh, 15 so he's, years. Oh, so he's still going to be around for a while. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And your other teacher is? Uh, Gawan Rinpoche, who you know. Yeah. So I'm on Gawan Rinpoche. Yeah. So I met Rinpoche. Uh, well, my first encounter with Rinpoche was in uh, Sikkim at his monastery. Right. But it wasn't. What were you doing there? Did you just have you to know? Go? I was actually with Geshela. We were doing pilgrimage. Uh -huh. And we went up to Sikkim and then we went to this monastery and, Rinpo and the Rinpoche's monastery in Sikkim there in Lingdom Gompa. And I, f I went into the Gompa there and it just blew me away. Uh, there was a statue of Padmasambhava and uh, 16 Kamapa, huge statues, and then the Buddha. And then I was really intrigued by that lineage. Turns out that uh, Rinpoche, I was going to America soon after. Mm -hmm. And Rinpoche was going to America soon after as well. So then we... Um, you went together? No, no. We mm -hmm. didn't really even know each other. That uh -huh. was like the first encounter. But right. uh, then uh, I met Rinpoche in, in Boston there. So that's how I came in contact with Rinpoche there. In Boston, you mean? In Boston. Uh -huh. But you had seen him in Sikkim? Or? Yeah. yeah. And then you met him in Boston. Yeah, we were connected uh -huh. in Boston. Do you remember the first conversation you had? You know, I didn't even, um, I remember seeing Rinpoche for the first time yeah. in Boston. So it was in, it was at Harvard and Rinpoche was undercover in a, a Buddhist 101 class. Can you imagine? Teaching it? No, as a student in the background. No, and he didn't have robes on. He was really undercover. Wow. And then I. And but you recognized him. I didn't recognize him. I recognized him as, I, I don't know, there was this weird thing. Yeah. I walked in and then um, I felt. I, I saw Rinpoche up in the back and I bowed, uh -huh. but I didn't know who it was, but I just felt like, and he was like, and then he was like, well, who is this person <laughs> who, who sort of knew me? And Ali was the same. Right? Yeah, Ali was the same. And so then- I, Ali being your wife. Yeah, Ali, yeah. yeah, Ali, my wife. So we, we both had that same karmic feeling. And so then the rest, then there was just that connection. So we didn't know. And then Rinpoche came, he, actually Rinpoche, the next class, Rinpoche had printed something out from the last class. Uh, on the same topic as the last class and he gave it to us and he said this is that so he's and it turned out that we didn't even know who he was still right. no kidding. and but it was a printout from his own book and do you remember what that printout it, it was about the uh, stages of death in the bardo so a nice introductory topic and uh, <laughs> yes. yeah, mind mindfulness <laughs> in everyday life right yeah wow so you know a lot of people these days daniel ask when you go out and teach workshops so, how do I find a teacher? Mm. How would you answer them? Don't know. <laughs> I, I, I think it's very karmic. Uh -huh. I feel like with Geshe-la and with Rinpoche for me, and both Rinpoche and geshe -la have said, like one time geshe -la, when he was explaining karma, he said to me, so why am I here? And why are you here? Mm. And why have our paths crossed in, mm -hmm. in Sydney here? What are the odds? And... Um, and that was his way of teaching me karma because I used to be very skeptical of karma. And then Rinpoche has said the same things. He's like, you know, only these sort of like strange conditions uh, he considers that karma has sort of brought us together. Right. So I think with uh, teacher and students, they're karmic. Mm -hmm. So should somebody look? Yeah, they absolutely. Should look. You were looking. Yeah, definitely. And you were asking questions, which is an interesting mm. uh, piece of the puzzle. I'm curious, we're going to get to your professional life in, mm. in a little bit, but the dharma, the dharma pieces so intriguing in a way people are aware of the origins of some of these teachings coming from you know tibet and japan and china and yes. so forth um and i think there was an influx of of um teachings starting in you know the late 60s and early 70s mm -hmm. into the west and now it's pretty full-on and i think a lot of people are at getting access to buddhism without even knowing where it came from really or yeah. what the basic sort of tenets of you know the the and the the original um, formations of it were, you got a PhD in Buddhist studies. Yes. So did you contemplate becoming a monastic at some point? Uh, early on, when I was spending a lot of time with Geshe-la, it sort of come up. 
He was a monastic, right? Yeah, he's, he's he a, monastic. a monastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'd spent a lot of time with him and with his um, other Geshe friends. Uh -huh. And so it felt like I was always around monks. And then it would be more easier if I was a monk to go to the monasteries with Geshe in India. Would have been just, easier. It would have been easier, for, especially for Geshe I think, mm -hmm. rather than having a, a lay person um, be in all these situations. But yeah, so it, I felt a little bit like it might be more convenient. Uh huh. Oh. Uh -huh. But I never felt, you know, we I had these conversations with Geshe and I'd say mm -hmm. to Geshe well, Geshe um especially Geshe um friends who would say, well, you, would you come, like talk about being a monk? Yeah. And I said, well, if you if you can convince me that um, I should become a monk, yeah, because they're logicians, these Geshe's. Yeah. And and they they sort of, you know. We we discussed, and then I said, "There's many lay practitioners in Tibetan right. history, yeah, and they did okay, so maybe this will be okay." Keeping with the sort of topic, uh, this general topic of creativity, spirituality, and making a buck. So your spiritual track was very deeply laid early on. It sounds like, yeah, really profound part of who you are and what mm -hmm. you're interested in, in this lifetime. So how did your professional life develop? Why didn't you just say, you know, I'm just going to do this? I'm going to make my life. I have a PhD. I'm going to translate texts. I'm going to be a yep. hardcore professional Buddhist. Yeah. I happened? think the business thing had taken off before the PhD thing. Ah. So I oh. I did my first de degree in business. Oh. And so I was always always interested in branding and marketing. And so I was always juggling these two sort of um, you know, the Dharma and and marketing and branding. Yeah. So there's sort of it felt like two lives for a while there. So this is we have yeah. this in common, right? Yes. The feeling of going back and forth between the two worlds. Yeah. What, did it ever feel like you're being pulled apart? Like, yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, like, wow, this is so, uh, so intense. I, I, you know, tell a story in my book how I had to leave Los Angeles, you know, at the sort of peak uh, in the 70s of my music career, mm. and then going off to, to be the head of uh, Karma Chilling, you know, yeah. Contemplative Center for two years. Um, that there was some feeling of like being pulled apart in two different directions. Did you have that same experience or that same feeling? I felt, I think your story was more like, you know, you really made a choice to go right. in one direction for a little while. Right. And gave, gave up a huge opportunity and career. Yeah. I always tried to have my cake and eat it too. <laughs> but it did feel like to excel in any one, I needed, you, you needed to make a choice. Wow. And so was I compromising? Right. Um, and and for me, it was always going to be the choice was always going to be Dharma rather than business. I knew that. Mm -hmm. So, the, but at the same time, I always felt that you needed to be able to support yourself. Mm -hmm. And so like you right have livelihood, be, right livelihood. Mm -hmm. It's not set up like in India or Tibet. Our culture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's no support system for a professional Dharma. Student. Yeah, being a monk is right livelihood yeah. in those cultures. Yeah, exactly. Right, it's seen that way. Exactly. So I didn't even feel like there was that option for professional Dharma student. Well, couldn't you have been the, you know, next generation Robert Thurman, you know, professor at a prestigious university of Buddhist studies, translator of texts, you know, teacher. Yeah. I never had that. I never had that wish. Uh -huh. So the reason I did my PhD is one of my other teachers was, ba was dying. And his last sort of like instruction to me was go get a PhD. And I resisted. I said, no, I don't want to do that. Wow. And then he basically commanded me. <laughs> wow. So I, I ended up agreeing wow. and said, okay. And I'll where go, did you get that PhD? PhD? University of Tasmania. <laughs> yeah. he, he, he sort of suggested that as well. So wow. Tas where, Where's Tasmania? Yeah, yeah. In, in, the bottom, in the bottom of nowhere. No, bottom of Australia. You know, you know Australia? Sure. The yeah. island down at the bottom there, that's right. uh, Tasmania. It, it's, it's pretty easy to say that you've put these two things together into your current uh, uh, job, which is as the you're know, the CEO and the publisher of Wisdom, right? Yeah. So tell us a little about what Wisdom's mission is. Wisdom's mission is to um, is to connect people with the authentic Buddhist tradition. Okay. So for people who specifically want to, Buddhist, yeah, yeah, Buddhist. Okay. So connect people with authentic Buddhist wisdom. That's wow. sort of the mission. And the way I describe it is. Um, you know, the mission sort of expands as time goes on mm -hmm. in terms of how we connect people. Mm -hmm. But what we're trying to connect them with is, is, is pretty consistent, these timeless truths of Buddhism. 
Well, I'm now doubly honored to be on on, on, <laughs> on that imprint because, you know, some people could argue my book is sort of uh, uh, not so timeless. <laughs> no, I think more it's more timely. No, yeah. it's timely, yeah. and um, but the principles in it, yeah, are timeless. Yeah, in a way. Well, it's interesting that you do, so you, you see it as a Buddhist book, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, it's inter- I'm trying to personally bring it out in a way that it's it's not constricted by that identification yeah you know that the, the the type of meditations that's presented in our universal mindfulness and compassion things like that so um you wouldn't take a hindu book or a sufi book or a, a shaman book and publish it on wisdom um most likely not it'd have to have some connection right so it'd have to, to some to connection tradition. to buddhist tradition yeah yeah of course you you remember my suggestion for the book that we could put together for wisdom that would sell millions of copies. What is that one again? Wisdom for Dummies. Wisdom for Dummies. Yeah, we got to do that book. I think I can write that book. I'll definitely need to read it. (laughs) Or it could just be W-I-S-D-U-M-B. Yeah, yeah, wisdom. Wisdom. (laughs) So um, there's a creativity coming out. Yeah, there you have it. Yeah. Well, you know, we talk a lot about as you know, the kind of sense of vision, which you're clearly a visionary in terms of taking that job on. And then what what is your notion of the vision for wisdom going forward? Yeah. I mean, obviously one thread of it is to be authentic portal for yeah. traditional Buddhist wisdom. But what else could you add to that mix that, that would be unique to your vision for it? Yeah, there was a, a conference I was at and I was asked to speak to about the future of publishing mm-hmm. in the Buddhist context. Mm-hmm. So, and basically it was a gathering of all um, people who run Dharma centers. Mm-hmm. There's quite a few of people, it was like international gathering. Mm. And um, so I started off by saying, who in the room first encountered Buddhism via a book? And 99% of the people put up their hands. Yeah, sure. And That's then it's right. like, it just shows how important <sighs> books have been in the right. transmission of this, this, these teachings to the West. Yeah. And then, but then I said, and most of them were, you know, baby boomers, Gen X, mm-hmm. you know, people, directors of centers. And I said, imagine 10 years from now, imagine 15 years from now. And I asked the same question. Mm-hmm. There's going to be less hands raised. Wow. And so how are people, how are people connecting with the Dharma? Mm-hmm. Whether it's YouTube, whether it's Facebook, who knows where yeah. that's going. And I said, that's the future. Mm-hmm. We have to be in those places. Mm-hmm. You know, wisdom has to be in those places. And so I felt a big part of the vision that I needed to bring to wisdom was to help wisdom be in those places. Yeah. So um, get into different media, yeah. do podcasts, do online courses, the stuff we've, we've been doing together. You know, as you're saying that, Daniel, I'm thinking that scene from The Matrix mm. where um, uh, Neo has to learn kung fu yes. and they just they plug him in and they show him doing it and then like seconds later he looks up and he goes i, I know, know kung, kung fu, fu. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's like i'm I a tenpo <laughs> you know yeah like plug it in and somebody has 15 years of buddhist uh training implanted into them yeah um it's it's uh mind-boggling almost to think how and, and it's interesting to think about it, as the media changes from books yeah to whatever you know multimedia digital uh, communication how the training um goes you know what does that change the way that people will be trained in the future do you think absolutely i think books will be always important as far as i can see for now Uh but it's it's the auxiliary content Uh so like we have your your book now right but we just we just have been filming together a lecture series right and so most likely people will come across the lecture series before they read the book right so that's the 99 percent of the hands that went up a- absolutely 15 percent of the hands are going to go by saw it online or so yeah the and then maybe 99 percent yeah. first encountered dharma online well do you think books have a future as books absolutely yeah 50 years from now do you think somebody was sitting reading a book on a beach people will be reading but uh, but and it- we can call it a book what it will look like, who knows? Yeah. Uh-huh. But I think there's there's a place for, um, you know, written content, mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah. Of course, the Buddhist path trajectory started before books started. Isn't that yep. true? Yeah. 
So can you say a little bit about that for people who don't know? I think uh, the oral transmission were, has always been important for Buddhism. But there were no books. Yeah. At the very, like from the time that Buddha lived and taught, yeah. as I understand it, for about several hundred years, there was no written transmission. That's right. So it was only oral transmission. Yes. Transmission. Memor memorization becomes very important in that. But it's still a game culture. of telephone, you know. Yeah. Four noble truths. I thought there were, there were five. <laughs> <laughs> what was the fifth noble truth? <laughs> so, um, yeah, the oral transmission. Now, what are the different kinds of transmissions in Buddhism? There are more than one, right? Uh, yes. So there's the, the what, what do you mean exactly? Well, like? there's oral, yeah. there's mind transmission, right? Oh, there's okay. sign transmission. Yeah, so, okay. so there is the, um, what is it, the, the four kindnesses of a lama. Okay. And, and it's, they trans, do the transmission by uh, or, oral, by sign, by mind. And I think, I think written is, I don't know if written is one of them. There uh -huh. might be three. Uh -huh. It's escaping me at the moment. Yeah. But I know what you're talking about. Oral, at least oral. Yeah. Gesture or mudra. Gesture, sign, yeah. And direct transmission, yeah. mind to mind. This is in the Dzogchen teachings. They talk uh -huh. about this a lot. Yeah. So that's true, not just of Buddhism, but kind of everything, right, in a way. Yes. You know, if you think about well, body, speech, and mind, yeah, it's body, how we speech, commun and mind, it's communicate. How we communicate. Those yeah. three. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you think Buddhism suffers from being perceived as a kind of specialized kind of knowledge, maybe not accessible because it seems clouded in kind of intricacy? You just said something like really mm. powerful. Mm. Body, speech, and mind is how we communicate. Yeah. Now, if you then say, oh, well, it's Nirmanakaya and Sambhogakaya, and, mm. and you start to articulate the 19 versions of this and that, yes. can you lose the power of something as powerful and simple as saying, we communicate through body, speech, and mind? Things get lost in the details for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. and there, there is a tradition of the pith instruction. Yeah. What's that? And that is a direct statements that get you straight to the heart. Yeah. Of, 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 and this is like... You know, and signs can do that, mm. right? Signs like E equals MC squared. Yeah, is that, well, yeah, we could say that. Yeah, yeah like Whoa, this is yeah. pith instructions. This is the real essence. And you know, when you've got someone who has really tasted it, yeah, and is is giving you instructions from experience, yeah, is very powerful. So, can you cite a couple of examples of pith instructions? I think uh, the dohas from Sadaha. You know, there's a thing called gur in like a. Spiritual songs, dohas. Sure. And what that is, what a doha is, is when a great master has realization, yeah. they express it through body, speech, and mind. Right. And, and it's spontaneous. So expression through body might be dance. So uh -huh. we have, and this is creati creativity in, at will play. Okay. Right? So a great master has a realization and then spontaneously expresses it through dance, through song. And of course, their mind, it's an expression of their mind. Well, and those traditional monastic dances that people see, somebody made those up at a certain yeah, point. Yeah, right? that's where it came from. So like the yeah. famous, we, our tradition, we share a tradition, mm -hmm. the Zomang tradition. Mm -hmm. And the Zomang tradition is very famous for a Chakra Sambara dance. Mm -hmm. And this Chakra, the, the origins of this Chakra Sambara dance is from um, a yogi that got, who has realized mm -hmm. and then um, expressed that realization through their body. Mm -hmm. And then um, that gets passed down and then becomes more formalized. And this is where the details come in. Sure. So the dance we see now and in um, Tibet, they will do that dance 24 hours. Like it won't stop. So they'll have different teams come in. Oh. And mm -hmm. it's all formalized and ritualized. But maybe that looks quite different to the original essence of what that dance was. I don't know. But right. we, can, we can say that. But, but in terms of creativity. Yeah. And people saying, well, you're not really creating anything. This is traditional. You know, people like to say that Dharma is traditional. I'm doing it the way it was done. Somebody in the beginning made the whole thing up. Oh, expression is creativity. Right. So all these forms which sort of feel like you have to do it this way and hold it this way and so forth. Somebody in the beginning just said, I think I'm going to do it this way. <laughs> yeah. And if you think about where those dances came from, there were creative expressions of realization. Okay. You cannot get more. It's the, the, it's the essence of spontaneous act, action. Right, right. So it's a funny twist, isn't it? That, yeah. that, that spontaneity. And we've, taught, we've joked about this before, yeah. but when you look at these very formalized monastic institutions, you know, yeah. and their 15 year Kenpo degrees, yeah, and yeah, stuff, yeah. it all goes back to, in our tradition, to crazy yogi Talopa. Yeah, that's right. Right? And, um, you know, um, who 
my son Ethan would say by today's standards would be uh, analyzed as having a psychotic break. <laughs> Seeing blue people in the sky and, yeah. you know. Um, so what do you think the balance is, because we can take this into the creative world, between uh, the spontaneous quality of realization and then this ritualized uh, follow-up on it? How do, you, how do you maintain that balance? I think uh, it's, it's one is outwardly. Mm -hmm. so, so when someone has realization and they express it, it's very spontaneous. Um, but then you can use, if you don't have the realization, you can use that expression and mimic that expression to get back to the real to get to the realization. Mm -hmm. So it's like a ladder. Or it's something? like a ladder. So like so that's how it gets formalized, and then you mm -hmm. get taught a dance, or you get taught a uh, um, visualization or a song, and you use that to connect with that uh, original um, source from where that creative energy came from, which is the realization. But you, can you get hung up on the ladder? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. So then the forms sort of take over for a period of time. For sure. And then That's somebody the breaks through, you know, uh, you know, maybe you can tell people about the mad yogi of Bhutan. Oh, Drupka Kunli. Yeah. Drupa Kunli, yeah. Yeah, because I think this idea of crazy wisdom is something some people are magnetized by, some people are repelled by. They, mm -hmm. they just say, oh, this is fake thing and, uh, you know, these are just crazy people. Mm. But the way Trung Rinpoche used to talk about it was he said the right translation is wisdom crazy. Yeah. So the wisdom comes first, meaning. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and the crazy is not crazy. It's just from a conventional point of view. It's beyond sort of conventional forms. Yeah. So Drukpa Kunli was what, 15th century AD in Bhutan? Yeah, I think something like that, yes. And he did all kinds of strange things to, to yeah. wake people up, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. For sure. He, he, was, he was out there, that's yeah. for sure. So um, what's the balance between that kind of bursting bu somebody's bubble, let's say the part of the Dharma teachings where you're breaking through somebody's conventional mind and also sort of training them to be kind of more linear and more logical. You, you, you have the unusual quality of studying the Galutpa tradition, which is maybe perhaps a little more linear or not yeah, necessarily? Yeah, for, for sure I see Geshe-la as like a, the great scholar side of things right. and Rinpoche as the Siddha. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Although Rinpoche is a Kempo as well and has been mm -hmm. trained very well. And of course, geshe is a yogi. Right. But but you know they have definitely have different emphasis. What's their relationship like? Uh, they don't really know each other. Only oh, through me asking. Okay. Um, well, Rinpoche said this, or Geshe said that. <laughs> like your father, putting them into Im imaginary debate. <laughs> like your father and mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's you know. I mean, here's a conversation you and I have had at, yeah. at uh, Hungawi Restaurant, which is a great vegan Korean restaurant oh, yes. in Manhattan. Yeah. And we were talking about this book coming out, and I said, "Well, how many copies of the book do you think we're going to sell?" Mm -hmm. today? And I think you said something like eight thousand. I said eight hundred thousand. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, which which was sort of the vision of the of the project. Um, and then I said to you, I asked you, what's your vision for your personal future? Mm. And it was interesting. Out of at the same time, like it was like watching somebody with binoculars, and they split, and one went left, and one went right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said, I would like to with Ali, my your wife. Yeah. I'd like to do a ten year retreat. That was mm. one train of thought. Yeah. And then the other, really quite simultaneously, without any kind of like cognitive dissonance or gap, uh, you said, on the other hand, I would like to take wisdom mm. into the future and create a very broad platform for the sort of onset of uh, and availability of the Buddhist wisdom yeah. into the West. And I just looked at you for a while, yes. you know, and I thought, you are a perfect person. You should read my book. <laughs> I did your workbook, which was fantastic. <laughs> Well, how, how would you resolve those? I, I, I want to say I resonated deeply with both of those aspirations, but how would you resolve them in a sort of linear time in a temporal domain which we live? How yeah, it's been the story of my life in a way, uh -huh. trying to solve that puzzle. Okay. And, you know, I, you know, I've been through various iterations of when I was doing marketing. I was, I've always brought Buddhism into it. So uh -huh. I was like, okay, marketing, basically that's just Dakshin Namjai. Mm -hmm. Just exchange, equalize and exchanging yourself with others. So if you get very good at being able to look from someone else's perspective mm -hmm. uh, in the Lojong practice, mm -hmm. then you can just do that in marketing. So who's my audience? What's their need? What's, and so you jump into their shoes and then you can come up with a proposition and your whole marketing campaign takes from, away from that. So who is your audience? If my audience or was... Wisdom. A wisdom's audience? Yeah. I think people who want to, uh, who want to live um, inspired and meaningful lives and 
have a tendency to draw that inspiration from Dharma. From Buddhist Dharma. From Buddhist Dharma. Dharma. Yeah. So one, A, a is to live an inspired and meaningful life. Yeah. And two is we're providing a channel for those people, in particular the ones who see an important element of that is studying uh, the traditional Buddhist teachings. Yes. That's pretty, that's pretty good. Do you have that as your vision statement for the company now? It, um, that's my personal vision statement for the company. So when yeah. I was doing your workbook, that's sort of the thing stuff that's I was writing down. That's the kind of thing down. that you wrote down. And, and, you know, um, and it's very much in accord with my own values of what I'm trying to do. In, in your the, life. In my life, Certainly. yeah. Uh, and then um, it was, is there a sense of the size of that market? You're yeah, a branding and marketing guy, you said. Yeah. So what, what's the size of that market? I want to be inspired and visionary in my life, and I want to sort of access the Buddhist teachings as, a, as an important channel for that. Yeah, to me, that's millions of people. You know how many Jewish people there are on the planet Earth? Mm, no, I, no, tell take, me. Take a guess. We're very 20 million. It's only 14 million. 14 million. So you th and, and there's like, uh, I think, how many Buddhists? I think maybe 200 million Buddhists. Yeah, it depends if you count the Chinese. As yeah, Buddhist, yeah. I mean, I, if you count them, it's, it's like huge, it's huge. Yeah, and then there's you know something like 800 million Hindus and like a yeah. uh, couple of billion Christians, you know, and yeah. uh, so and and Muslim also is a big one. So the Buddhist crowd, even just if you use that metric, there's already lo a lot of people to right. to to talk to. That's right. um, my premise is that. Many, many people say I'm kind of a Buddhist, but I don't. I, I'm not, you know, registered. I'm not a registered Democrat. I'm kind of a Democrat, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I'm not a registered Buddhist. Yeah. So that's I want, why I say people who draw yeah. inspiration from the Buddhist um, world you yeah. don't have to be Buddhist. Well, so look at the mindfulness yeah. revolution. Yeah. Is that a Buddhist revolution? Do you think? No, I think mindfulness is uh, goes beyond Buddhism. For example, the Buddha, the Buddha himself, learnt meditation from you know, the yogis, forest yogis that were around at his time. So Buddhism can't lay claim to ownership of the practice of mindfulness. I don't That's believe. Yeah. So the focusing or concentration element, the shamatha element, yeah. is not inherently Buddhist, is what you're saying? No, the Buddhist teachers were going into jhanas. There's some people that say that the term, they weren't really going to jhana. Yeah. But in any say way, what I, jhana is for the people who don't know? Just deep absorption, of meditative like, absorption, deep meditative absorption. And uh, like a kind of going into a zone kind of, a, a certain kind of yeah, spaced like, out quality? Uh, I, I don't know if it's spaced out, but it's withdrawal. Withdrawal. And it's withdrawal and it's, it's a deep absorption, right. meditative absorption. Right. Um, and and to, to where you withdraw from this Form well. Okay, now don't a lot of people think that's what meditation is for? When you talk to people, they you, think th checking out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, as a as a meditation teacher. That's probably the single most consistent thing I try to communicate is we're not checking out, we're checking in. Yeah, yeah. And so when you um, say Buddhism, then like how would you define? In other words, you're sort of limiting in a way your vision to the people who are paying attention to the Buddhist tradition. In, in, can you visualize a segment of the population that might not characterize themselves that way, but that might be interested in, in, in the basic principles that we're talking about? Absolutely. How, yeah, I think the content drives our audience, right? Uh -huh. So the people interested in the type of content we're drawing from. Um, so that we'll, you, know, you don't have to say, I'm Buddhist, uh -huh. but to benefit from your book. Anyone who mm -hmm. might be inspired by some of the ideas in your book, right. that's our audience. Right. But I don't think you can also say, I, we're going to be everything to everyone. Obviously, you don't yeah. want to do that. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like you have a clear mission and a mm -hmm. clear focus. Um, probably potentially more so like you have two things, but a, a lot of people at your stage might have 30 things or no things. To, yeah. to, 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 it seems clear those are your two. Your two. Which two? The, well, the, the, the branding and marketing and bringing the Buddhist wisdom to the, well, to the niche and to yeah. the larger group and your own personal evolution as a practitioner. Yeah, and I'm coming, uh, you know, I'm coming to new understandings around that because I used to think that you had to do the personal work first before uh -huh. you could bring uh -huh. something to the world. Mm -hmm. And then, then you'd um, be dead. <laughs> then you'd be dead. I also like the analogy. I think Freud had this. No, no, you, you all maybe had the analogy of the alchemist, right? Uh -huh. And so the, the alchemist is there trying to turn lead or some substance into gold, right? right. He's into the transforming the mm -hmm. substance. Mm -hmm. 
but the real work he's doing is, as he's doing that is transforming himself, mm. right? Mm-hmm. So now I Good. think of oh, my work oh. at Wisdom, it's not like I, you know, my work at Wisdom is also my work on myself. So they're right. coming together in that way that uh, the analogy of the alchemist, I, I, I like, quite like that. But you've sort of mixed these two elements in your day, right? You spend a fair amount of time doing your personal practice, mm-hmm. and then you work your butt off to run the company, That's right. right. So do you find you have any time or life left at all over after that? Or is that pretty much a consuming formula? It's fairly consuming, I'd say, I think. Do you have any hobbies? Surfing, but I don't do much surfing in Boston. No. (laughs) 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 Yeah. So, um, but I'm always, you know, for me. Are you still surfing actively when you travel? Yeah. When I go back to Australia, I'll go surfing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You still have, where's your board? My board's in Australia. Yeah, at, at 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 folks house at or? my brother's house. Your brother's house. And yeah. is he still surfing? Yeah, all my, most of my brothers still surfing. What do they think of your Buddhism thing? Uh, th- that's just all, who I've always been. Sometimes they say, "Don't zen out on me." That's their line. Zen out. <laughs> Don't zen out on me. Which means like kind of like stay, stay in the fray, stay with us. Uh, uh, yeah, it's have like a beer, put a shrimp on the barbie. Sort of that. Sort of that. Yeah, yeah sort of that. Jim. Yeah. What do you think is uniquely Australian about you? What is what does it mean to be Australian? What's the what's the gestalt of an Australian person? I think Australian has a like a she'll be right type attitude. Like what they, kind of, that's like a relaxed attitude to, to well, what things, word did to you drama. Say? She'll be right, mate, is what we say. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like a it'll be all right. It'll right? be all right. Like so, it's sort of like almost Jamaican or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an island kind of culture. Yeah, it is Australian. Australia is an island, so there's yeah. this sort of I think of Australia, so now I have a different perspective of Australia. I see Australia, though, though it's changing a lot and fast, Australia's a, a, there's, there's a real leisure culture about it, especially uh, where I grew up. Okay. There's a very God realm sort of So it's not like there. work yourself to death kind of thing like mm, America is or n- Japan. Yeah, there is, it's not like, so of course, if you work in Sydney down in Martin Place, yeah, where I used to work. Right. Um, yeah, there is that. But yeah. the general feel. Yeah. Everyone's chill, you know, chill. Yeah. and you know, what's your next holiday? Right. How was your last holiday? Right. There's a lot of that, and now Australians are going to beat me up when I go back for saying right. that. But right. that's maybe the they, feeling maybe I get. Maybe they won't. Maybe yeah. they. Maybe they. You know, maybe that's part of the thing that they like. I think it's a fantastic part of the culture. Yeah. yeah. Now, in as a Buddhist practitioner, where does chill fit in? What What instruction have you ever received in in your Buddhist studies that would equate to Chill. Yeah. Uh, the, the yoga of chilling out. I like that yoga the best. And what is that? Is that Mahamudra? Is it oh, Mahamudra? Rinpoche is the better, you know, that's one of his instructions is Rangsha uh, Shak. Just relax. Relax. A lot of his meditation instructions is to relax. relax. So that, that's sort of Mahamudra style, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's kind of a sort of very developed, advanced style of meditation, but it's very simple at the same time, yeah. would you say? The instruction's very simple. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the words are very simple, but... Yeah. So he's telling you, okay, well, I'm going to give you this very ornate, elaborate practice to do, but just relax while you're doing it. Don't, don't yeah, do it. yeah, so... Um, or don't even do the elaborate practice, which? Uh, most of... So it depends on the person, but for me, Rinpoche's... Uh, there's a lot of elaboration, but the essential point of the meditation practice is to rest and relax. Is oh, like right. Tulopa's famous. Well, Rinpoche is considered Tulopa, so he's famous. Rinpoche is the instruction: "Me know me, some me, send me, show me, It's like a, don't reflect, don't project, don't uh, don't fixate. Um, you know, just relax. Yeah. Well, you just said a powerful thing, mm-hmm. Garwang Rinpoche, your teacher, and mm-hmm. who lives in Sikkim most yeah. of the time, right? Yeah, yeah is considered to be an emanation, as we say sometimes in the mm. Tibetan tradition, of the founder of the entire Kagyu lineage, which is Tilopa, mm. who we mentioned earlier as a crazy yogi, who, by the way, lived by the, was a hippie by anybody's standards, yeah. lived by the banks of a river, mm-hmm. uh, was um, you know eating just the fish heads that the fishermen were throwing away. Mm. And when his key disciple, Naropa, who was like, I, call like the Bob Thurman of the of the of the ancestral <laughs> story. The professor, the PhD yeah. at, at Narop at Nalanda yeah. University, yeah. goes to find his teacher and they say, that's him over there. And he literally can't believe that that's going to be the guy who's going to teach him. Yeah. It's mind blowing. So um 
And you're saying that Garang Rinpoche is, in essence, the same type of mind, the same type of energy. Yeah, he's considered, they, they, he's considered this, the emanation of Tulopa, yeah. And has a close relationship with Trungpa Rinpoche. That's our, that's yeah. our brotherly Dharma bond as well. That's, so our two teachers are. That's some deep stuff right yeah. there. Yeah. So for those of you who are not into this lore, I mean, the basic point that we're making is that the quality of the realized, uh, you know, practitioners in the Buddhist, they can be extremely spontaneous. Mm -hmm. It's not this programmed, highly intellectualized, calibrated thing. It's like you don't know what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. Tolopo is famous for upsetting uh, Naropa's expectations of what's going to happen next. Yeah. You know, so... Um, do you have that relationship with your Talopa? Does he throw you off the top of buildings and make you Rinpoche go? Rinpoche doesn't uh, <laughs> throw me off the top of buildings. No. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. I think it depends on the student, right? I, can't, yeah. I couldn't but handle do, it. Is there a way he pulls the rug out from? from yeah, the, I think you, I think yeah. that's that's yeah. a good teacher will do that from time to time. Yeah. And Rinpoche definitely plays the complete role for me. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, this is an interesting thing for people who are just starting to pick up these threads in, in, in the West and explore uh, what these kind of teachings are, uh, I think it's helpful to emphasize that there are many levels of teachers that you can encounter. Yeah. And you're talking about somebody who you know you're, you have a very deep, full commitment to. But aren't there also teachers who you know, can just point, you know, give you instructions about how to meditate and how to do compassion practices yeah. and stuff? Could you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I think um, there's many different types of teachers. And depending on the type of instructions you want, mm -hmm. different, like, you know, like learning anything, like learning mm -hmm. the piano, right? And you don't necessarily need to learn from like a... Vladimir uh, Horowitz. Yeah, exactly. So Okay, play your C scale. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, so I think there's the same in Buddhism. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I think that um, you have to... You have to know what register right. you're in as well, because it's important in right. terms of the way you relate to that teacher. And that. Sure. So you don't, you know. And it's mutual too, isn't it? The, yeah. the teacher and the student are having a mutual creation. I think people don't understand that either ah, yeah. completely. I agree. You know, it's, uh, it's like, oh, it's the teacher's creation, but it's a mutual creation. Yeah. So um, it's, 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 um, it's very unusual, though, that he's from a classical Buddhist tradition and, and giving you, treating you not like a kind of second class uh, student, but really empowering you with the, full, with the full transmissions and teachings that he has. It's, it's unusual. Uh, yeah, I think Rinpoche is uh, very, very generous, very yeah. kind. And what yeah. kind of business person is he? he? You know, his father was an amazing businessman. Really? In Sikkim, he was, he was um, so Rinpoche's grandfather was the, the king of Sikkim, right? Well, there and you so go, his ladies, mother was, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, his <laughs> mother was a prince. It's often in Buddhism, like, the, you know, Buddha was a prince as well. So sure. there's this theme that runs through, and I'm not really sure what that is. But in, in any yeah. case, Rinpoche's father was a great um, businessman in Sikkim, yep. and he's he's growing up. Um, he he Rinpoche was either going to be a great businessman, yeah. or just or, like Buddha. Or, or, yeah, so Very, that's what they say about him. Uh, his his uh. family says, "Wow, if he had gone into business, yeah, yeah, uh, it would have been fantastic." Well, and as it is, doesn't he advise people on all kinds of levels of activity, not just Dharma? Like, if some, would somebody come and say, should I buy this shopping mall? Yeah, people do Rinpoche. that. Yeah, so Rinpoche and, does predictions and stuff like he that. He does. Yeah, and well. he'll, or he'll Did Trungpa Rinpoche do that? Did people well, come I, and ask him that sort of stuff? Yeah, I think that in the traditional role of the Lama, yeah. it, and it's hard, there's no real comparable thing in the West, but you know, in, in China and Japan yeah. and Tibet, the person's your physician, yeah, they're yeah. your strength. Uh, there you may be your calligraphy teacher, yeah. you know, and, um, and your friend yeah. and advisor. So um, I think anybody raised in that tradition as Trungpa Rinpoche was, is used to people going, oh, I have this new girlfriend yeah. and should I, what should I do? Should I marry her? And, you know, he had two ways of interacting, three really. One was definitely do that. Yeah. Two was your guess is as good as mine, which is the mm -hmm. other extreme. And three was somewhere like looking at, looking at the, subtleties of what's going on and maybe exploring it with you, like helping you solve your life puzzle. I think I've seen Rinpoche do all three as well. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes they go, whoop. Yeah. Uh, what, what's that great saying? Not my circus, not my clowns. Not my circus, <laughs> not my clowns. I love it. I never... 
<laughs> I love that. It's, it solves it's, it solves a lot of problems when you just know when to say that. So and, maybe and, when I hear Rinpoche say it's not definite, right? right. It's not definite when yeah. uh, he means not my circus, not my clowns. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's uh, you know, and 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 you know, for us as students and as teachers, sometimes it's helpful. Uh, I have, uh, as you know, a, t a Chinese teacher in in New York, uh, mm. Sat Han, mm. Master Han, who's. Uh, I remember one time I was, because uh, you know me, I like to get inside people's little life puzzle and, and yeah. nudge, nudge around with yeah. them. And um, yeah, I was talking about somebody that way and sat on and said to me, eat your own noodles. Eat your own noodles. Eat wow. Your own noodles. I love that saying. So that's another good one. Not my circus, not my concert, eat your own noodles. You see these, I think like if you run your business like this yeah. or your creative project, yeah. it's going to help tremendously. So all these advices, all these Dharma advices, right. I think they apply so much. Like, yeah, you know, I always think of like the three trainings: Sheila, Samadhi, Prajna. Yeah. Right? Okay. These can be applied. Can you explain what that is? For also, people? Sheila is like discipline. Right. Uh, Samadhi is like uh, uh, concentration and attention, right. and Prajna is wisdom. Okay. Intelligence. And so we, we can talk about Sheila. Yeah. Sheila, right? Which is discipline. Um, and this is Sanskrit, everybody. No yeah, Sanskrit. Okay. Yeah. So um, I feel like. You know, basically, the essence of it is don't do stupid stuff. Right? <laughs> That's the wisdom. That's essence the, of yeah, uh, yeah. Don't, so don't do, do stupid stuff. Yeah. What does it mean? Right. Well, you know, no killing, no stealing, no lying, no sexual misconduct, right. no intoxicants. You, of course, you know. So in business, what is what? What can we grab? So if you're running your business, I think the the no lying, the right speech, and no sexual misconduct is really important stuff to abide by. Sure. And it's and just go to work and don't do stupid stuff. Yeah. That's like baseline. Yeah. Sure. Um, right speech and yeah. so like eat your own noodles is one of the yeah. advices yeah eat your own noodles is even um, you know a redirection maybe of some intelligence that's gotten too active and too mm. you know it's an interesting thing in the Buddhist tradition right you have to ask for teachings mm -hmm. also in sh like shamanic traditions you have to ask for a reading Really? Yeah. So, like, uh, as far as I understand it, some people develop a, a high degree of intuition, yeah. and they can read other people. Um, and so, the, the, my shaman friends, I said, "Well, what do you do if you're in a restaurant? You know, and you, you mm. see somebody, you start to get information coming in about the person." I thought, I thought, well, okay, I understand the idea of don't go up to them, and tell them stuff. Yeah. But they took it farther. They said, "Don't open the book. Don't, don't oh. even look. Just turn it off." So this is this is also related to eat your own noodles, right? Don't go yeah. there. Yeah, don't go there. Yeah. Even at the at the at the mental level. Yeah. So now let's talk about employees. Yeah. Because you're a boss, right? Yeah. So you have to eat the other people's noodles a little bit when you're the boss, don't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. Things <laughs> things can get complicated, right? Yeah. So one of one of the things that um, I'm intrigued by is the overlay in the professional environment yeah. of the family dynamics. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how, well, a do you like being a boss? I don't like the word boss, but I like being a boss. Okay, what word would you use? Leader. Leader. Okay, do you like being a leader. Yeah, I like being a leader. Okay, and so what have you learned that you could share with everybody out there? In well, I always think world? what Buddhist principles do I bring to play? And uh -huh. the wisdom people here they know, like when, like I talk about Samaya, right? Actually, right. Oh, at well, we talk about Sheila Samadhi Prajna. So Sheila, we interpret. As basically, I consider businesses, the business, internal business, and working with employees and us all working together is basically what we're doing is making promises to each other. Okay. So a whole, you can boil the whole thing down to a group of people coming together, making promises to each other right. to get somewhere. Right. And so I say that, um, so we, in, when I say, when I use Buddhist terminology of wisdom, I say we're all making our samayas together. Mm -hmm. They're our promises. Commitments. Samayas commitments. Commitment, yeah, right? commitments. We make our commitments. And then our shila, our discipline, our main discipline is to keep those commitments. Mm -hmm. And so if I so in wisdom, how you how what would that might what might that look like? Editorials working on a manuscript and they they have to finish it by a certain date right. and in a certain um it has to be in a certain condition to hand over to production. So that's a promise from editorial to, mm -hmm. to production. Right. There's one day. Timeline. Timeline. And it comes down to one single day. It's a promise, a deliverable. And so that's the well, that's one of the main things that wisdom between those two departments, and so then people have a shared a shared commitment there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's two people that have a commitment right. around that date and what's going to be delivered. 
And so you have to honor that. That's right. really important. And so, um, and, so, and so how should that commitment, how should that samaya, if I'm still using the Buddhist terminology, right. come about? So we have a dialogical approach. So whoever's involved in that commitment, they will get together. What can you do? Right. When do you need it? Right. They come up. So they come up. It's not me saying that has to be ready on this date right. as a boss. Right. I'm like, so let's get around a table. What, what are we all going to agree to and commit right. to hold? Right. And, um, and, you know, Buddhist, Buddhist teachings and how I've worked with my teachers have really invo- informed my management style. And then I always say that, and then we have a thing where, so that's the, that's the when. We mm-hmm. share the when. Mm-hmm. Now, the how right. is up is up to the person who's responsible, who's holding the manuscript or holding okay. the job. And they that's, do that how? That's their noodles. That, I don't, yeah, that's their noodles. That's right. my, oh, and everyone, you don't care how they're going to do it. Mm-hmm. As long as they turn up on that day the sh- and com- honor their commitment. So you don't micromanage at that point. Yeah, I think that's the independence. That's the, that's the skillful means, right? That's, that's a great template. That's such a great model yeah. for running something. And then we say, we always say, you can talk about the how, right? but when you haven't, it's, the time to talk about the how is not when you're not going to make the when. Mm-hmm. So you don't turn up to the, the day of the when mm-hmm. and start talking about the how. Right. You need to have done that months ago. And that's the, that's the sort of language we use around wisdom. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly... Uh, I wonder if, if that, 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 that principle has been expostulated anywhere really care, skillfully because that's a really good principle mm-hmm. for business. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe when you get an MBA, they teach you that, but I doubt it. Mm-hmm. You know, I really doubt it. What about leaving business at yeah. w- at work like do you, are you ever at home on your bed at 11 at night typing an email because somebody's up in in uh in singapore at that time or, or is your work lacing through your everyday life in, in in a kind of invasive way um it's lacing through my life i wouldn't say it's invasive yeah so you know i can you know my practice in the, the business sort of always always operating Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i'm you know i'm interested in this idea we talk about energy and virya yeah keeping energy together and then that may need turning off at some stage Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. turning off the email turning off the computer so just what 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 you're referring to is um there's a chapter in the called learning how to monitor your energy which is um kind of intriguing as you practice meditation, even if you practice for a day, mm. you notice your energy lagging. They call it laxity and elation, right? Yep. Those, those are the two obstacles to having a steady practice. So when you start to sag, you know, which is, you know, when you're doing a lot of things, you're carrying a lot of weights, you start to like a, an old mule, you just go, I don't want to do, I don't want to hear one more pe- person coming into my office. I don't want to hear one more complaint about the timelines, yeah. you know. Do you have any sort of techniques that you use to kind of rouse your 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 uh, what we call wind tours? Yeah, I think um, sam. The idea of sam. So now I use another concept, uh, uh-huh. a Buddhist con- concept is sam, and that's that sam means like border. So um, if you go into retreat, you create a sam around oh, you. Okay. And so I do uh, the first weekend of every month. Um, those two days are retreat days. So I do a proper sam. I don't come out of the house. I do my practice. And then I'll do, like, I just came back from a month in Sikkim. So I think those times are really important for re-energizing. Right. So leaving time for formal, uninterrupted formal practice with a boundary around it. Yeah. Yeah. Meaning you don't answer emails during that time? Oh, no. The internet's turned off. Internet's off. That's part of the psalm, turning off the internet. That's, this could, there's another book right there. Yeah, yeah. There's another book right there. Yeah, no, this is, and for creativity, this is amazing. Yeah. Wow. This space you can give yourself. I think so many people are steadily, steadily, steadily not having any sun. Yeah. And it's going away. Mm-hmm. And what's happening is there's a kind of um, obsessive and relentless quality of communicating. And there's no refreshment yeah. of this rejuvenation principle. Yeah. So, you know, somebody was asking the other day, what about, you know, are we had, remember in a, we did the, the, the Q and A live Q and A, yeah, yeah. And, and somebody was saying, "How do you, in a world that's obsessed with this kind of communication technology, how do, how do you establish any kind of ground of sanity?" I'm pretty convinced that there's going to have to be some. I think that we now have a way of talking about it, where you you whatever form it's taken, even if it's a chip in your head, you turn it off. 
Yeah, <laughs> you absolutely. Know, and you just go back into the still, you know, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, I quote him a lot, mm. the three pills, you know the no. three pills? No. He, he says this, you have to take the red pill, the white pill, and the blue pill. And the first one is stillness. Yeah. The second one is silence. Mm -hmm. and the third one is spaciousness. Yeah. And he, that's what he describes meditation, mm. which I love. I've kind of like, uh, you know, shamelessly quoted and, and, it's and, fantastic. and quoted that. Because that puts it in a very simple place for somebody who doesn't speak the, you know, the secret handshake coded yeah, language. Yeah, yeah. Stillness, I get that. Don't move. Yeah. Try not moving for, for a while without going to sleep. Yeah. Westerners, when they stop moving, they fall asleep immediately mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, I went to a meditation place in, in L.A. and they were like couches. People were lying down. <laughs> that was their idea of like, okay, that's the only way I'm going to get out of this thing is I just got to collapse. Um, but stillness and then silence oh, and spaciousness. And I think if you just, those are the viruses that are coming, entering the system. Well, we, we should think of those system. as food. Like, they're, it's like a food. Mm. Stillness, silence. Oh. This is like a food for food that for creativity, food for your practice. Mm. It's like eating, sleeping. Yeah. You need, you need oh. these times. That's why mm. you need a sun. I think you're right. I think, you know, five years time, there's going to be people knocking down your door saying, David, take me to the monastery. Um, where I can put my phone around away. It's happening already. The mountains. Yeah. It's interesting in the corporate, high end corporate world, there's a, a tremendous interest in going away to these places, yeah. Latin America or Asia, or whatever. Um, and, you know, maybe some interest in the, the Buddhist side. Yeah. But definitely in the transformative experiences, like going for an ayahuasca journey or yeah, something yeah, yeah. like that, sign me up. Yeah. Um, but the idea that they could then take the same principles they learned of sort of steady, precise way of being and bring that over to a, a form of practice, I think that's going to be a slow fit because people are burnt out and they're looking for a kind of relief. Yeah, no, I imagine, I imagine, you know, the monastery at Sikkim that I go to, yeah. I imagine taking a group of CEOs there and, and running some sort of like a some sort of uh, program there. Yeah. I think that would And be you designing the content. Yeah, I, I, or, yeah. Yeah, I think the the content's pretty self evident. Yeah, so I when you talk about creating a program like that in mm -hmm. Sikkim, and allowing people to go on that as a sort of a journey for them, and catering a little bit so that they don't see it as something exotic. No, my intuition is lately, a lot of people have been not reclining in the Asian. They're actually building them up. Yeah, yeah. The monasteries and things like that. Yeah. And I have to think somebody with powerful, powerful mind and mm. awareness is going, we're going to create a bridge. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to like begin to ship people back and forth over the bridge, just like, <laughs> just like the cover of the book where yeah, there's absolutely. the monastery and they're coming down from the monastery. And this is the important part, coming back into the world. Yeah. It's kind of um, inspiring, you know, to, to talk with you as it always yeah. is. We, we um, yeah. all the people on my podcast are people I talk like this with anyhow. Yeah. So it's just been a kind of... Um, I anticipate having a lot of fun with it. And the conversations move gracefully between, you know, spiritual practice, mm -hmm. uh, life, you know, everyday life, and, and um, creative ideas about business. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, you know, fantastic that we're on this journey together, Daniel. Oh, no, I, yeah. I treasure this friendship. Yeah. I'm glad we can work together. It's yeah. like tendril in action. Yeah. And I think your book is really important because it's really at the forefront of bringing these ideas in a practical way for people to in their daily li daily life yeah just like live this stuff yeah find freedom find find creativity uh and and really ex you know dissolve these like this duality between spirituality and you know daily life yeah yeah i think this is what the west may be the west role as buddhism comes to the west mm -hmm. this could be one of the main roles this integration sure. Sure. Well, wonderful. Thank you so Thank much you so for much. joining the podcast, and I hope we can have you back again soon. <laughs> of course. Okay.